Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, and now... Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed Ali. The 100th Nobel Peace Prize is awarded for ending a brutal 20-year war in the Horn of Africa. I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is Abiy Ahmed. For two decades, Ethiopia had been fighting a war with a bitter foe next door. Then came Abiy Ahmed. Hailed as a great reformer, the Prime Minister did what so few expected he could, end his country's conflict with Eritrea. His efforts have earned him the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. He's also been praised for bringing rapid reforms to his nation. He lifted the state of emergency, released thousands of activists, and allowed exiled dissidents to return home. Pollsters had predicted a win for climate activist Greta Thunberg or even New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. So was Ethiopia's leader this year's most deserving contender? Well, to debate this, I'm joined now by Ewol Alo. He's a human rights expert and law lecturer at Kiel University. He also nominated Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed for the prize. In Norway's capital, we're joined by Henrik Urdal. He's the director of the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. And from Charlottesville in the U.S. state of Virginia is David Swanson. He's the director of World Beyond War, a movement aiming to end global conflict. Good to have you all on the program. Ewolalo, let's start with you. I know you support Abiy Ahmed. I know you nominated him. In, in the context of everybody else who was supposedly in the running, do you think that he was overwhelmingly the most deserving? I think so. Um, I think this is somebody who came uh, out of nowhere, essentially, uh, transformed the Ethiopian political landscape, a, a very, uh, you know, a country with a very long history, very fractious, very volatile political environment. He changed Ethiopia for the better. Uh, he also played such a decisive role in terms of transforming the uh, landscape in, in the Horn of Africa, particularly in terms of advancing the agenda of peace. So certainly, yes, he is the most deserving candidate. Hendrik Ordal, does the man deserve the medal? Well, absolutely. I think this was a, a very well-received prize uh, all over the world, basically, both in Ethiopia uh, and regionally and uh, globally as well. Uh, I think uh, he has been clearly one of the front runners uh, this year. Uh, the only question that, that has been raised is, is whether, uh, you know, it's, it's still too early. But I think the Nobel Committee made a very bold move to, uh, to uh, give him the prize now, uh, which, of course, uh, also means that uh, there is a great expectation uh, that he is meeting all the expectations that, uh, that he has created. David Swanson, is it hard to argue with all the reasons given for Abi Ahmed getting the prize? Well, he's certainly more deserving than virtually any other president, the president of the United States or Turkey or anywhere else. He's, you know, it's not as good a prize as ICANN was two years ago, the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. The prize was set up to fund peace activism, activism for the abolition of war. I don't know that he needs that funding. But as a president, who a prime minister who's come in and conceded territory uh, at risk to himself, has survived an assassination attempt, has has made peace something bold and courageous rather than war, uh, he is certainly a far better choice than, than we might have seen. Yeah, well, with the Nobel Peace Prize, controversy is really far away. And when you look at some of the previous winners, it's easy to understand why. Barack Obama had only been the U.S. president for nine months when he picked up the prestigious accolade. And this year's Literature Prize went to Austrian author Peter Hanke, an apologist for accused war criminal Slobodan Milosevic. So is this what was originally envisaged when the award was first set up a century ago? Adam Pletz takes a look. Gentlemen, I'll come back to you in a second. The Nobel Peace Prize is perhaps the world's most prestigious award. Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, and the Dalai Lama have all been recipients. Since 1901, 106 individuals have become Nobel laureates, only 17 of whom have been women. 24 organizations have also been bestowed the honor, among them Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International, the UN, and the EU. 
But with three wins, the International Committee of the Red Cross has been recognised more often than any other organisation. Swedish industrialist Alfred Nobel bequeathed his vast fortune to set up the Nobel Prizes, which were first awarded in 1901. If it's ironic that Nobel became rich through the invention of dynamite and weapon sales, then it's perhaps fitting that the prize that bears his name has had its fair share of controversy. When US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger won in 1973, the New York Times suggested he was the Nobel War Laureate. Other awards have been premature at best, Yasser Arafat, Yitzhak Rabin, and Shimon Peres never saw a settlement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Aung San Suu Kyi's failure to condemn the repression of the Rohingya people prompted calls for her prize to be revoked, but the Nobel Committee says a prize is for past achievements and is held for life. Barack Obama was awarded the 2009 prize after only nine months in office and little to show for it. To be honest, uh, I do not feel that I deserve to be in the company of so many of the transformative figures who've been honored by this prize. But many believe the Nobel Committee's biggest mistake was not an award made in error, but rather one that was never bestowed. Despite being nominated five times before his death in 1948, Mahatma Gandhi never received the Peace Prize. Will 2019's award to Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed stand the test of time? Or was it too early to judge the reconciliation he orchestrated between his country and Eritrea? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Let's go back to our panel now. Henrik Urdal, lots of questions about it. Is this maybe just a nice story we tell ourselves and we award these medals and we talk about peace? And yes, there are other facets to the Nobel Prize for literature and you know, different scientific endeavors and so on. But does it really make a difference, especially when it comes to the Peace Prize? Because the track record doesn't seem to suggest that. Well, I, I think uh, I don't quite uh, entirely agree with that. I think there are some uh, some cases where the prize has, uh, has uh, definitely been instrumental in uh, making a difference in processes. And I think uh, this year's prize is, uh, is uh, going to be measured uh, uh, along the same lines. I think the prize in 2016 to Santos really made it possible for Santos to, to push ahead with the uh, peace agreement uh, with FARC in Colombia. Uh, and I think it, it probably uh, meant a difference in, in terms of uh, making sure that that process didn't do well. Whether this prize is going to, to uh, uh, stand the, the, the time uh, uh, as well as, uh, as some of the other prizes is, is still uh, unclear. I think uh, it's quite clear that, that Abiy Ahmed needs to deliver uh, on internal developments. He needs to deliver on democratization. He needs to deliver on uh, developments in the region. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure on him, but this prize also means that uh, he will get the international support uh, for these processes. And I right. uh, think uh, that it is possible that he can actually deliver on okay, these okay, promises. Okay, fair enough. But then again, uh, you know, while it might be great for Juan Manuel Santos' CV to have the Nobel Peace Prize, the situation on the ground right now in Colombia suggests that that peace could unravel and his successor is a president who doesn't like the FARC very much and doesn't like the peace deal, right? So again, it's almost as if to say, well, Santos did his best, but will it actually be sustainable? We don't know. Do you accept that, Henrik? No, absolutely. I, I do accept that. And it's, of course, difficult to know exactly what the situation in Colombia would have been uh, without the peace prize. Of course, if we had no uh, peace agreement at all, it probably would not have been uh, any better than today. So uh, there, it's, it's always uh, difficult to, to sort of second guess what the, uh, what the uh, development would have been uh, in the absence of things like this. But, but I do hope that, that this is a prize uh, that uh, can make a difference. But of course, if you're going to give the prize only for past achievements, it becomes a, a, a sort of uncontroversial uh, and, and perhaps, you know, toothless prize uh, right. in the end. Okay, and I guess the David Swanson, the most extreme example of the aspirational element of the Peace Prize was when it was given to Barack Obama when he hadn't done anything yet, right? 
<laughs> you would think so, yes. But then remember that Dr. Martin Luther King, who you began your piece with as the quintessential uh, prize winner, he turned against the war on Vietnam after having received the prize. Uh, and I think the difference there is that he was not a politician. He was an activist. Mm -hmm. When they gave the prize to May Reed McGuire, she began to spend year after year after year working nonstop with that prestige and that money toward peace and disarmament and abolishing war. So give it to an activist uh, who's done great work in the past year, and maybe they will do great work for many decades to come. Good points. Awal Allo, Peace with Eritrea, the release of uh, political prisoners. Uh, Medemer, I hope my pronunciation is, is correct. It was in your letter to the committee. It's also something that is spoken of very fondly in Ethiopia, the kind of overriding philosophy and of, of sort of inclusiveness that Abiy Ahmed has infused in his leadership. It reminds me of the philosophy of Ubuntu in, in South Africa. He's done all of these things, but we saw a big test very recently when there was a possible coup attempt, a possible assassination attempt. It shows that a lot of people in Ethiopia are not happy with what he's doing. Tell me how big of a test he has ahead of him uh, now that He's made these reforms, he's made peace, and he's got the Nobel Prize, but is he really in the clear? I think there are two really distinct issues here. One is Ethiopia itself and the transitional process that he is leading in Ethiopia. And I think it's important to understand just how complex the Ethiopian state is. It is an empire. Uh, that consists of something in the area of 80 different nations, nationalities, and people held together by force, all of whom have very different claims, very different experiences, and very different visions of the future. In order for Abi Ahmed or any single individual to bring together all those uh, different views and different perspectives, um, in a context of democratization where everybody is now allowed to say whatever they want and make whatever claims uh, they wish, uh, is going to be very difficult. And I think the challenges that Ethiopia is going through, particularly in terms of maintaining law and order, uh, you know, a huge number of people that are displaced, although they are now um, uh, resettled again, that is very much, I think, part of uh, the broader package mm -hmm. of reforms and transition that also resulted in some unexpected uh, uh, outcomes. But I think on the question of peace and the commitment of the Prime Minister to peace, I think he has a very solid record when it comes to that. Uh, the fact that he took uh, some serious personal risks in terms of uh, changing the political landscape in Ethiopia, opening up the political process, uh, pardoning uh, political prisoners and allowing those who were um, um, you know, designated as terrorist organizations uh, to come back and, and participate in democratic politics. Those are all risks that he took for peace. But most importantly, I think, what he is doing at the regional level in terms of uh, kind of changing the, the, the image of the Horn of Africa, which is seen as kind of highly volatile region. Uh, so when he was appointed as a prime minister, in his inaugural speech, the first and I think one of the most important policy, foreign policy statements he made was uh, unconditionally accepting the Algiers Peace Agreement and the decision of the Boundary Commission which actually gave Ethiopian territory, or at least what was until then, Ethiopian territory to Eritrea. Uh, that was a huge compromise as an Ethiopian leader, uh, and he did that for peace uh, at great personal risk to him when there were some very significant and powerful uh, elements within the Ethiopian government who were opposed uh, to that at that point. Uh, I think beyond Eritrea, uh, what he has done in, in terms of bringing various actors in the region together, so the, the uh, tension between Eritrea and, and Djibouti, Eritrea and Somalia, Somalia and uh, Kenya, uh, in South Sudan, uh, most recently uh, the, uh, the deal between the force of freedom and change and the, uh, the military junta in Sudan. I think that tells you that this is somebody that is uh, absolutely committed to agenda of peace right. and also determined to push it through even when it means some personal yeah. risks to and him. And he he's had immaculate credentials. I wonder, Henrik, do they think politically in the committee? So, for example, in a time when perhaps the committee is thinking a top priority is extremism in a place like Pakistan and Afghanistan, we give it to someone brave like, like Malala. Um, at a time when we want to, you know, North Korea is threatening nuclear weapons. We, we give it to 
the disarmament uh, committee, those scientists and so on, are they thinking that the lesson from Abi Ahmed is that maybe the Israelis and Palestinians, maybe the, the Indians and Pakistanis and others can learn something from this man and that's the top priority? Do they think politically and strategically like that? No, absolutely. The, the committee is, is certainly uh, attuned to these issues. And I think, uh, you know, what the committee is, is trying to say here also uh, more broadly is to, you know, put the past behind you and move on and make sure that you're taking the first step and being willing to risk uh, something uh, in order to create peace. And, and that's a very strong and, and powerful message that, uh, that they're sending uh, in this case. And with that in mind, David Swanson, realistically speaking, if you were... Um, on, on opposite sides of a conflict elsewhere in the world and you see someone like Abiy Ahmed get the peace prize, do you think, oh, maybe I, I want some of that. Maybe I'll uh, extend the olive branch to my enemy. Well, one certainly hopes so. Uh, and I certainly hope that a message reaches Western governments where that prize to ICANN two years ago was not just a message to North Korea. It was it was for a, a group that was working against the desires of Western governments, which is very unusual for the Nobel Peace Prize. And here, I would love the message to be received in Washington and other Western capitals. Stop selling weapons to countries waging wars in the name of democracy and start giving actual humanitarian aid with no strings attached to places that are actually acting out democratically and for peace. Uh, you know, I would much rather see uh, U.S. dollars and European dollars going to a place like Ethiopia for the cause of peace and democracy rather than more and more weapons for the rest of that region and the Middle East, uh, you know, in the name of democracy, which nobody takes seriously. Okay, very finally, I will allow. Let's sort of put aside the the analytical hat for a moment. How proud are you? I'm very, very proud uh, as an Ethiopian and also as an African. And I think uh, in order for an African statesman, uh, a very young, um, uh, dynamic individual uh, to come out of nowhere, uh, change the political fortune in his country, uh, and also change the image of a region. And I think that is a very proud moment uh, for us as Ethiopians, but also uh, as Africans. As you know, uh, while people within their own corner, within their own um, specific regions and, and towns, they could have differences on all sorts of little details and policy issues. But I think there is also a bigger picture uh, here in terms of uh, how these recognitions are awarded to people in different parts of the world. This used to be a highly Eurocentric award. Uh, I think the fact that it is progressively moving uh, towards also recognizing uh, other people in other cultures, I think that is a very important move on the part of the committee. I, as an Ethiopian, feel uh, very proud and happy. Right. And Hendrik Urdal, to those naysayers and cynics and critics, I'm, I'm one of them, right, uh, who feel that maybe the prize is not fully fit for purpose because a lot of our idols who have received the prize in the past have broken our hearts, have let us down there's still hope because of what? Well, I, there's always a risk uh, involved in, in giving the prize to, to a state leader. But uh, Abiy Ahmed has been installing a lot of enthusiasm, uh, not only in its own country, but, but in the whole region. You see that also in the reactions from, from neighboring prime ministers and, and state leaders, both in Kenya uh, and in Somalia. So there is strong uh, belief in the agenda that uh, Abiy Ahmed is representing. And if he's able to pull it off, it can have huge implications, huge positive implications for the whole of East Africa. So, so this is uh, this is a reason for rejoice. Okay. Well, it was a prize created by the inventor of dynamite, as was mentioned by Adam Pletz. Perhaps to do some conscience cleansing, if you like. But nevertheless, here we are. It's 2019, and we're still debating the, the values and the merits. And it's still, if you looked at Abiy Ahmed's response as well from his office, uh, a lot of pride and a lot of dignity in that response, uh, very gracious in receiving it. Let's uh, hope that uh, Ethiopia moves on to even better things. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Henrik Urdal, Ewol Allo, and David Swanson, thanks for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Well, a previous, more controversial winner of the Nobel Peace Prize is Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. In 1991, while under house arrest, she won the award for her nonviolent struggle for democracy and human rights. 
But in recent years, there have been calls for her to be stripped of the title after failing to stop a brutal military crackdown against the Rohingya ethnic minority group. Earlier, I spoke to Yang Yi Li, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar. I asked her if she's seen any improvement for the Rohingya since the crisis erupted two years ago. I'm afraid that there has not been a single movement, none whatsoever, that indicates there is any improvement for the situation of the Rohingyas mm. inside Myanmar and outside of Myanmar. Now, recently, a five-year-old child was among 30 Rohingya who were arrested in Myanmar. They were trying to get to Yangon. So we have a situation where they can't leave Rakhine to get to other major cities. And your report also said it's too dangerous for them to leave Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar to go back home. So what's going to happen with them? Are they just herded like cattle in these apartheid-like camps? Well, I think uh, you've just uh, said the right words. It is an apartheid-like situation in uh, Rakhine State currently. Though, you know, we have to remember that in Sitwe, the capital city of Myanmar, there's uh, still 128,000 Rohingyas living in internment camps since 2012. Mm. And in northern Rakhine, in Butidong, in Mongdo, in Ratidong, there's some villagers left, but we really don't know the fate and their livelihood, what their daily life is like there. Um, I know they've been trying to cross the border to Bangladesh, even in recent days. Uh, but I was really appalled to hear about the 30 that was caught in Yangon and as young as five years old. The word genocide has been a very contentious one when it comes to this story in particular and the fate of these people. Your office and your report has said they are at risk of genocide. Tell me exactly what that means. Well, genocide has to be proven by court. It's a, a term that can only be um, proven uh, through all, through all uh, sides and investigations from all sides to be proven. However, um, I have indicated even in 2016 and 17 that it bears the hallmarks of genocide because you know, there are some indicators of genocide. And uh, FFM, the fact-finding mission, and myself, we've, also, we've concluded that there is the intent for genocide. And we could see uh, four out of the five uh, categories or the indicators of genocide uh, present now in Myanmar. Their UN representative, Myanmar's UN representative, has called you biased. They said you lack impartiality, objectivity, and good faith. Um, are they essentially in denial when it comes to what's happening? I think so. I, on, and publicly, they're in denial. And I think I, there's, they've got to know, these uh, public officials got to know that the vast number of people and the severity and the volume of the, the damages that was created by the Tatmadaw is something way beyond humanity. Um, and I, I have to say that the, some of the officials have called me even worse names mm. than biased and, and um, not uh, impartial. Mm. And you've met with Aung San Suu Kyi and I followed that closely. What was Many interesting, times. yes, and, Many and, times. and you mentioned that she threatened to restrict your access when you were pushing back against her and asking for more access and were, were criticizing, and then eventually you were banned from the country. What's your message to her right now? I mean, presumably it's harder to get a face to face meeting with her right now. What's your message? Hmm. Well, I've, I've said this publicly that, you know. I'd like to ask her, is this what she had aspired for, for the decades when she was in house arrest and, and what she was fighting for, democracy and freedom for Myanmar? Is this what she really wanted? And I, w I had said in my last report to the Human Rights Council in September that I really would like to implore her to open her eyes, 
listen with her heart and to see what the real situation is in uh, Rakhine and other places in other ethnic states in Myanmar. Mm. And today's the day of the Nobel Peace Prize. Abiy Ahmed's got it for trying to make peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea and for his work within his country. A lot of people doing a retrospect and looking well, at congratulations. others. congratulations. Yes, certainly. A lot of people doing a retrospect and looking at others who got the prize over the years. Aung San Suu Kyi, one of them as well. Do you believe that she needs yes. to be stripped of her Nobel Peace Prize? Well, I, I understand that the Nobel Peace um, Committee has no policy of stripping anybody from their uh, prize that they won uh, for whatever reason that they uh, acquired it. So, um, well, I think the Peace Prize issue is in, in the past. And we all know that her record since uh, receipt of the Peace Prize is so different, so dramatically different from what the international community and even the people of Myanmar mm. believed that she would do. And that is all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.